Okay, so uh, this, uh, this paper began uh, last November, talking to Eric and uh, getting feedback. <clears throat> and uh, uh, anyway, uh, he has this great question about uh, is, <clears throat> uh, is chemistry reducible to quantum theory? So that's kind of what I'm going to go after in a way, but it, it gets into all the questions about ontology and epistemology. And <clears throat> I really like the work of Lombardi and, and, uh, and Brackle and so forth. Uh, good stuff. And Eric, I was mentioning to him before that, that, that uh, he's really done a lot of work in this area. And uh, one of the best things is he does, he said, I don't know, I don't have a solution for a yes and no. I said, because I think the way he was approaching it, it's not solvable, yeah, which is okay. Uh, but it's the integrity that I really respect most because a lot of people are just ideologues. They say, oh, this is the answer. But, okay, so let me roll on here. <clears throat> uh, I have my background. Uh, basically, philosophy of science. Okay, these are my my uh, mentors and so forth. And, and uh, uh, Feyerabend was my uh, honor system advisor at Berkeley, and then Lakatos until he died was my PhD advisor. Anyway, but I decided I didn't like science. I didn't like philosophy of science. Uh, the scientific worldview was all deterministic, and like I didn't see myself in that uh, world. And uh, and the logical positivist uh, thing that came out of it didn't make any sense. And gradually, I morphed over into what I'm calling philosophy of engineering. I think pragmatism was an earlier attempt at that. So here's roughly what I'm going to try and do. Uh, so kind of my main, my main pitch here is that all reductionist arguments, whether it's reduc reducing biology to chemistry, chemistry to physics, uh, sociology, whatever, politics to uh, economics, whatever you want, they're all based on mechanical premise. They're all mechanical arguments. Uh, so, so what we have to get rid of is mechanics. <laughs> and surprise, that's what quantum theory does. So, and then I want to point, uh, close to you that quantum theory is not a mechanical theory. Uh, it's a post-mechanical theory uh, in which me mechanical theories are idealizations. And then uh, the complementarity out of uh, quantum theory is what forces this idea of choice in, uh, in quantum theory and the idea of an observer and so forth, but I'll get into that. But it forces us from a what's called a spectator position to a participant position. Uh, uh, Putnam picks up on this in external, internal, but I think uh, spectator and participant are more uh, uh, better off. So then I want to, another thing is that quantum theory is not only uh, post-mechanical theory, it's also a thermodynamic theory. Uh, this, we've all sort of been misled as mechanics. Uh, and then I want to talk about uh, the entropy nonsense and its relevance to understanding ontology and how the elements came about. And then part two, if I'm going to get to it, uh, I want to start looking at what does a, a participant worldview look like? So if once we get rid of this, you know, everything's going to be reduced down to quantum theory, then where do we go? And basically we go upscale and uh, uh, into a new uh, epistemology, a new ontology that makes sense, uh, and it makes sense of us and in the world. Uh, anyway, I'm going to go through all those things. So again, the core argument here is that all reductionist arguments are reduction to a mechanics. And, uh, uh, and what defines a mechanics, uh, uh, so if we're going to a a more general post-mechanical thing. It has to be pretty formal. This, and you saw it with uh, quantum theory, uh, Bohr called the correspondence principle. And the idea is that the correspondence principle is that, that the new theory needs to be able to understand why the old theories worked. You know, you can say, oh, see how it worked, but it was, you know, it was a limited deal. And the other thing about the superseding theory is the supersede. Now, supersede is trickier. Supersede means that it's conceptually more sophisticated. Okay, in other words, that the, what we're going to, the new epistemology and new ontologies are going to be conceptually more sophisticated. Uh, I've written a bit on this, if you want, but the main thing is that you really want a formal uh, version of sub, subsume and supersede. A lot of people go plurality or something, and it's not going to get it there. So we have to make, to, in order to, to solve this question of uh, reductionism, we have to make a, a paradigm shift. The paradigm shift is not within science, it's from science to something more general. Okay, so uh, just to try and be clear here, I want to be, what does it define a science for a mechanical system? And what I want to say, a simple way into this is to say repeatability. Okay, I can do Galileo's experiment, you know, 
He's there and I can do it in, uh, in Los Angeles. It's the same experiment, supposedly. You know, same cause, same effect, uh, so forth. These are maxims of what we mean by science and mechanics. You also have action and reaction symmetry. So the net change of any mechanical system is zero, and that's your conservation laws. Uh, so, and, and what I call the scientific hypothesis is, is basically that all phenomena, it's a mechanical hypothesis, all phenomena in the universe are governed by one time, space, and varying order. As you see, people say, oh, well, the laws of the universe must be the same at the beginning, and they'll be there forever. Why are they saying that? That's an assumption, not a discovery. Uh, a slightly more sophisticated version of the dynamic equilibrium. This is also mechanics, but uh, steady state models you know, in geology. You know, Volcanoes go up and things come down, economic supply demand, biology, homostasis. Again, the key thing is uh, conservation and climate change. And uh, the, the, the physicists say, like, oh, isn't it quaint that uh, engineers think that they can actually change the course of events? Because we uh, physicists know that everything's completely deterministic from the beginning. Uh, and like Stephen, Stephen Hawking has these things, I've noticed even people who claim everything is predestined and that we can do nothing to change it look both ways. Look. Uh, look before they cross the road. I think that captures the common sense position. Uh, corresponding physics. Well, this is an example. It's like, okay, flat earth theory. It's not that the flat earth theory is wrong. It's just very limited. I think it works very nice. It still works. And from the spherical earth theory, like, ah, it's, it's working. You're a little tiny piece of a very, very big sphere. So I can see why people believe that, you know, in the flat earth theory. And it works within, within the realm. Okay, another step in this direction is so the, the idea is that. Uh, Biological evolution and economic you know, systems are all uh, engineering enterprises. And uh, this is my friend George Guerrero, who puts it for some He says, all engineers should be taught that they are, and that what they're doing is a natural extension of biological evolution. Now I want to take that back further, because this has to be one, one, one overall narrative here. So I think it goes back to cosmology. Those of you who are familiar with Timaeus, the, uh, the, the, uh, arch you know, the architecton, you know, it's an engineer. Okay, so quantum theory, you know, the Feynman, if you think you understand it, you don't. And uh, Bohr, if, if you're not shocked by it, you, know, you don't you understand it. Um, and uh, Lee Smolin has really gone after this, kind of a friend, and he, he's just like, kind of like, this isn't really working. He had a, a, a group of graduate students, incoming graduate students, and this is in 2010, but he, but he says, uh, yeah, when my generation entered physics in the 60s, uh, we're the second generation of quantum physicists, we were intent on solving the question, what is reality, uh, where the first generation had failed. He says it's now 2010 and it's become rather Kafka-esque, that we haven't made any progress whatsoever. And, uh, and Lee is very good, he's starting to say uh, what time is. In other words, it must be the case that the laws of the universe change. In other words, this idea that the laws are the same forever and ever, it's not like, there's got to be something wrong with that. And that's what he's been struggling with. I don't think he quite gets there, but, uh, but it's a good struggle. Uh, okay, so uh, quantum theory. So uh, why is it post-mechanical? What we had was we had a Newtonian program, we had a Maxwellian program, and they were both very, very successful. They were very, very nice. But there are no Maxwellian fields <laughs> in the Newtonian and, and vice versa. And, and what quantum theory is is a, is a bigger tent, okay? And it, and it says, oh, well, these are, these are idealizations. So in order to, to know, to figure out uh, Newtonian physics, you need to kind of ignore this other stuff and, and vice versa, go back the other way. Then they kind of get to the point where uh, they're, they're complementary. One expression I like this is to say, reality is more ample than any one of the mechanical conceptions. You can conceive it this way, you can conceive it that way. But when you do that, so he says, it's to conceive is to falsify. You can say, you conceive it in a particular way, you're leaving out something. This is okay, you want to do that. So Einstein has this, uh, so they ask him, what is reality? He says, physics is an attempt conceptually to grasp reality as it's thought independently of being observed. Now this is a spectator attitude, you know, it's like objective reality out there and we're here you know, trying to figure out what the laws are. So then he says, uh, in pre-quantum physics, there was no doubt as to uh, how this is to be understood. In Newton's theory, reality was determined by a material point in space-time, and in Maxwell's theory by the field, uh, in space-time, uh, and quantum theory is not so easy to see. And what he's saying is, like, in the Newtonian program, you know, like, there's no distance between, there's no, everything's infinitesimally the same 
time. So, so the only way you can have everything happening at the same time is having the same place, which is material point, total locality. Okay, and in, in, uh, in Maxwell, it's a field, and the field's like, it's distributed. Now I can get hold of, uh, you got a sense of distributed in space, but completely distributed in time, I have a problem with, but of course they just embraced it as Minkowski space and block universes and all that stuff. And, you know, if you have fun with that, good. Um, uh, uh, Bohr, there's a guy named Plutnitsky, I don't know if you read Plutnitsky, it's about 100 articles about really detailed stuff about Bohr and Heisenberg. He talks about Bohr's later position in 1949 in particular. And, and he says, like, Bohr's colleagues, they kept pressing me, he said, well, Niels, what is quantum reality? What is theontology? What is there? He says, there is no quantum reality. Get over it. <laughs> now, what I think he means by that is there's no scientific reality. There's no mechanical reality because this is what quantum theory says. He's saying, no, there's no mechanical reality. There's no particles like Grego and Gregory. It's not that there aren't particles. It's just that they aren't eternal particles. Not that there aren't waves. It's just that they aren't eternal waves. They all change around and do things. So, so I think that's what he's saying. Okay, so Heisenberg, what I call Heisenberg insight, says not only waves and particles are complementary, but it must be that the experimental setup to, to look at particle, you know, think of the two slits, if you look at it this way, look at the wave uh, aspect, those two experimental setups have to be complementary. He says the actions leading to the setup of one, the actions leading to the setup of the other, are also complementary. So he's seeing complementarity in reality. Now, uh, De Broglie takes that another step. Uh, he, he basically says every measurement uh, has a, uh, both a particle and a wave aspect. This has been experimentally demonstrated multiple times. <clears throat> and uh, so in effect, everything that you measure, everything you do, has this dual aspect, okay? <clears throat> so I want to say for the ontology, the quantum ontology, or at least an aspect of quantum ontology for what Du Bois is saying is it's, it's I call it middle ground, okay? It's, it's not particles, it's not waves, it's somewhere in between, hard to define, but it's somehow we optimize. You know, whenever you choose, whenever you get choice and, and collapse away function, you're always somewhere between these two idealized extremes. Okay, so how do systems actually evolve when you want to Well, they don't evolve mechanically, that's for sure. Mm, this is a problem because they don't do it unless you actually do something. But what they're seeing is all change. It's a different theory of change in quantum theory than there is in classical mechanics. All change involves an irreversible, irreversible aspect. I'll go into that more. So ontologically, quantum systems are historical. So when I make a choice, my collapse away if I make a choice, it brings me into a universe in which I had made that, in which I made that choice. So it has a history of me making that choice. Okay, so I'm bringing it out another, and another, and another. So I'm in the universe, and I am the universe as it evolves, as I'm making choices, as in collapsing wave functions, is including me in it. Okay? Uh, and it will, and so it's cumulative too, which I'll go into a little bit more. So, uh, so uh, Paul A. puts it uh, bluntly. He says, in the new pattern of thought, we do not assume any longer the detached observer occurring in the idealizations of a classical type of theory. But an observer who has his indeterminate effects creates a new situation theoretically described as a new state of the observed systems. So the main thing is, is complementarity forces us into this participant thing. Now, they got real, physicists got real excited about that first thing about the observer. What are the observers? Where are the observers at the beginning of the universe? 10 million years ago. Well, they don't really need observers. All they need is agents. They need an agency. They need something that performs work, and that's what collapses the wave function, which I'll get into. So, <clears throat> this, this move from the spectator, like the universe is out there, here, to the participant, uh, Dewey talks about this, and he, does, and he talks about it in terms of two different uh, representations of inquiry. These are two different philosophies of science, uh, Eric, as we've been talking about. So, the spectator deals is what we're doing. What are you doing? Scientists. Well, we're trying to understand the laws governing objective reality out there. Let's say one anecdote here. I remember I had a moment. I always thought I was a scientist. I had this moment where I figured I was going after the ultimate laws of the universe. And I had this moment where I'm like, wait a minute. There aren't any. In the sense that I thought. So what the hell have I been doing? So there's a, there's a self-reflective aspect of this. It's quite dramatic. I was like, wait a minute, so whatever I've been doing, whatever inquiry is, whatever advances we've all been making, they're not discovering ultimate laws, they're not ultimate laws. 
in the classical sense. Okay, so the, the other thing you have is, just, is the question changes. So now I'm inside the universe, I'm not asking about how things work out there. What I'm asking about is how to work in the universe. Uh, how do I get around in the universe? How do I find things? Practical knowledge, okay? There's a lot of people here that are talking about. So another aspect is, <clears throat> they call it Royce's self, criteria self referent coherence. It says this. Imagine, so let's say we have a universe. You say I come up with, you come up with a theory of the universe. Oh, I figured out the theory of the universe. Oh, great. You know, tell me what it is. But tell me one thing first. Are you in that universe? Does that, your theory of the universe have in it you having discovered that theory of the universe? Because if it doesn't, then it's not self-referentially coherent. I don't think science is self-referentially coherent. So what, what uh, Roy says is, well, learning, by that criteria, learning has to be part of the nature of reality. It's just, just part of reality. If your theory of reality doesn't have learning in it, it's not going to be self-referentially coherent. And uh, one of the ways Lakatos had an expression say, well, scientists don't need a theory of, of, uh, uh, s of uh, how to do science uh, in order to do science any more than fish need a theory of hydrodynamics in order to swim. So I modified that a little. Uh, children don't need a theory of how to ask questions in order to ask questions any more than fish need a theory of how to ask questions. So questioning is natural. I think it goes over with this. Learning is natural. Anyway, the, my argument here is that so uh, questions and learning must be essential here are useful aspects of nature reality. That's pretty radical. Uh, so, um, and, and uh, you can, so what we call scientific inquiry can only be made sense of in this larger tent. So instead of uh, uh, engineering being applied science, actually science is engineering research. Okay. Uh, da, 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 da. So anyway, so the end, so the, the new epistemology that comes out of this is that it's, it's, it's useful knowledge. It's, it's pragmatists had it down pretty well. Um, how to work in the world. It's about methods. Rorty is pretty good and all this stuff. Uh, and the ontology, though, of the world it has to have learners in it. It has to have agents in it. And there's something called Carnot's Epiphany, which is that we're, Carnot's Epiphany is that we're engineers in a world of engineering. And I say we're learners in a world of learning. So what we're learning about is not dead stuff. We're learning about things that are learning. And uh, seeking and perceiving, these are Leibniz terms. Uh, so this is uh, John Wheeler, same stuff. So this collapsing wave function. He says you don't have a reality unless you unless you have some way to collapse the wave function. And, uh, and in order to collapse the wave function, you need agency and uh, classical physics. Classical mechanics doesn't have agency in it at all. Uh, there's a beautiful essay by uh, Wheeler called Observership is uh, Genesis. And we go through this stuff. And an interesting part of that, he ends up, there's a footnote at the end of it, it just really make it a big deal. But he says, oh, and then when I presented this, someone came to me and they said there was a German philosopher who had already said all this. And you go back to what it was, it was Schelling. Interesting. Okay, so this question, the question changes. We're no longer spectators, we're participants in the universe, which brings us to new Republican uh, epistemology, and ontology, how to work in the world. Okay, now, the other thing I want to go is like that quantum theory is a, is a thermodynamic theory. Uh, this is being funny. So, uh, one thing to say is that, uh, look at uh, Planck's research, okay? What was he doing? Uh, well, it was blackberry research. The black, his blackberry research was funded by the electric light industry in, uh, in Germany, okay? And they wanted an optimization formula. They wanted to know energy out, what am I going to get? That's just what he went after. So, and he also, you know, he read his stuff. He, he, he didn't like Boltzmann's, uh, you know, particle stuff. Uh, and it, <laughs> he was really upset that he ended up having a statistical aspect as well. But he was doing thermodynamic research. He was not doing mechanics, okay? Uh, now, <clears throat> this is my, I was so <laughs> very excited about my muses, uh, Peter Atkins. So read Peter Atkins. He's a quantum uh, uh, chemist, Oxford, a million books out, so textbooks. So, you read him his books, he goes like, uh, uh, well, there were actually two versions of, 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 uh, of thermodynamics. He says uh, there's a Carnot and, and uh, Boltzmann. Carnot traveled to thermodynamics from the engine and then the symbol of industrial society. Boltzmann traveled to thermodynamics from the atom and the, uh, the symbol of emerging uh, fundamentalism. And then he says uh, thermodynamics still has both aspects. So they're like both alive and well. And I go, wait a minute, that was what I was taught. I was taught by much physicists. They said Boltzmann won. And, Carnot and caloric, those are sort of some, some sort of afterthought of 
<laughs> footnote of history. Uh, so, no, they aren't. They aren't. So, uh, I mean, they're all like that. So, uh, but they're not compatible. You can't, you can't derive one from the other. So the question is, I used to say, either Carnot eats Boltzmann or Boltzmann eats Carnot. Take a choice. Uh, you got to have one or the other uh, if you want a fundamental theory. Uh, unless one must be a special case within another. And I, my hypothesis here is that engineering thermodynamics, Carnot thermodynamics, is in fact more general. And I mean, the number of idealizations in, uh, in Boltzmann is just ridiculous. Uh, so this guy Cardwell, who was a professor at, uh, at Manchester, which was the beginning of the seat of the Industrial Revolution, very, very uh, into engines and stuff. He started looking at the history and said, like, yeah, engines? And I was like, isn't that history? This is nothing wrong with history. I mean, he says, most traditionally, it seems, the accounts of the development of concepts of work and energy have tended to describe them within the classical framework of Newtonian mechanics. This is what we used to call in the history of fossil science the rational reconstruction. Oh, the history must have happened this way because the world's mechanical. Okay. Well, it isn't. Um, and he says, I would like to suggest this may be uh, too narrow a case. Now, here's this anecdote. It's my friend, uh, Robert Yolanowitz. And he tells we talk about this a lot. And, and, and he tells us the story. He says, when I was getting my uh, PhD from John Hopkins in, uh, in uh, chemical engineering, he said, going for my PhD oracle, so I'm going to get the obligatory uh, uh, thermodynamics questions. He said, if I had said anything about particles going around or entropy, he said I would, would have been on the street the next day looking for a job in real estate. Okay, because they're engineers. They're engineers, and I went through eight textbooks. And what you find out, I said about four of them favored the engineering thermodynamics and mentioned that, you know, Bolson. And the other said Bolson didn't mention. <laughs> so it's there. Uh, so this uh, kind of this um, that's hard. Uh, I call this a Carnot to Clausius and back. And, and basically, I'm not going to read this whole thing, it takes too long, but basically, Clausius says, oh, Carnot is this really great guy, and he, and he found all this wonderful stuff, and it's really good. Well, maybe I get some of this. Uh, I mean, that's the second part of this. Good. But basically, he says, like, uh, this transmission, Carnot, uh, uh, Carnot regards as a change of heat corresponding to the work produced. He says expressly that no heat is lost in the process and that the quantity remains unchanged, he adds. This is a fact which has never been disputed. It is first assumed without investigation and then confirmed by various caloric experiments. To deny it would be to reject the entire theory of heat. Uh, and, and it forms the foundation of the whole thing. The next line is, uh, Klausi says, well, perhaps actually he's completely wrong. Okay. These guys are talking about two different things. And the, the, the nice Carnot diagram. Uh, this is this is not a this is not a nice uh, functional uh, uh, diagram of, of uh, let's say a Cartesian relationship functional relationship. What Carnot is concerned with is the area within the you know inside that. That's the work. Okay, work is a result of a cyclic process, and that cyclic process the heat is consumed. I mean, think of the Earth energy coming in and out is exactly the same. Heat and Earth made the same. We're doing all this anyway. I'm not going to go into all that. Uh, so the other thing about Carnot is this society comes up with this efficiency thing, which you know, I got to call out. The, you know, there's some uh, efficiency. Level. What this really says is that all action in the world is, is, has this limit, has this loss. There's always a loss. That conflicts with mechanics. Mechanics says, essentially, it just goes, you know. It just does. I mean, mechanics is like straightforward. It's a function. I can just tell you where it goes. So, it, so, Sadi's thermodynamics conflicts directly with mechanics. Look it out. Okay. So, and let me give you another example. Uh, Maxwell has this little book called Matter and Motion. So he has a deal. He says, well, you know, same cause, same effect, and these are maxims of science, what we mean by science and everything. But of course, this is not always the case. He says that. You know that, that it's not always cause and effect, and it's not always, so that's particularly he says when small ch uh, it's only true when small ch when changes in the initial conditions don't have any significant effect. Now, this is sort of like a butterfly effect. But what he's saying, what Maxwell's saying, this is that then he's saying mechanical motion is an idealization. Okay, real motion has dual aspect, which is what Carnot said too. And my friend uh, Ralph Abraham is just.
This is good. Okay, so I'll go back. So we got Maxwell's says that uh, mechanics is an idealization. Uh, uh, my friend Ralph Abraham is a mathematician and, and, and he wrote this in Euclid's Voyage of the Chaos. He's a big chaoser. And he points out, he said, people used to hold Euclid's elements. It's like the Bible was the thing. And you go into one society or another, it changed them. I mean, it's like, here was this incredible logical mathematical structure. And then he said, the chaos came on. And the introduction of chaos doesn't just say, oh, well, Euclid is the whole thing. It also undermined the logic, this logical mathematical uh, model that we were you know, fed in, uh, in philosophy of science last century. So I understand that. So it's saying like, oh, wait a minute, that is not right. So, so this is what uh, Drago, who I had to leave, unfortunately, and I are working on, uh, is our Carnot. And what Carnot does, uh, he's an engineer, uh, time of revolution, and he says, you know, wait a minute. So everybody knows, that's right, everybody knows that there's a trade-off between time, velocity, and power. I can do something fast, I can go slow, I can, you know, I can use a pulley, I can use you know, different ways of doing it. So everybody knows that. He said, when I look at these axiomatic mechanics, those rational mechanics, so they don't seem to have any account of that. And then we put it, I say they don't even have a way to make sense of the question. Because what he's seeing is engineers have free will, so to speak. It's constrained, of course, always, but they have options. I can go about it this way, but everybody walking down the street knows that I can go faster, I can go slower, I can go this way, that way, and all these trade-offs. So that doesn't make sense in these axiomatic systems. So he starts out and says, well, let's try and, I want to create a, a, a bigger tent, I call it, okay. So he says a bigger tent. And within his bigger tent, the sciences are special places. Okay, and he has a whole bit on that trouble. Okay, so one of the people that he says inspired him, or at least inspired a development of his thought, this guy, Mopartoy, and it basically, Ideas. So there was this thing called the Vis-Viva controversy. And the Vis-Viva controversy is back Descartes versus whatever. And there were two uh, ideas about what was conserved in motion. So we had two theories of motion. And what was conserved in motion, according to one, was MV, you know, mass times velocity. And the other was MV squared. And they go back and forth and back and forth. And what was right and what was wrong. And Descartes was wrong as he said, you know, whatever. This goes on for a long time. And, and uh, Maupartois, I think, and Leibniz suppose he has it too. And, Euler had it, whatever, but I like Mopartoy because it's pretty clear. What Mopartoy says is they must both be right. Okay, we can't derive one from the other. They're actually complementary. An example is like an orbit. Okay, if you have an orbit of a planet, it has a, you know, that linear motion and then it has a gravitational motion. In order to have a regular orbit, you know, keep going, you, have, you need to have an optimization of these two components. So, so Mopartoy goes on, he says, well, uh, there's a bunch of stuff about Fermat and so on, but anyway, uh, he says, all action, he this idea of action, he says, all action is an optimization of these two complementary components. Uh, okay, so he goes on, I'm not going to go into it. And he just says, I think he says, reality is middle ground, uh, blah, 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 blah. So, uh, Mopartoy picks up on that, I'm oh, sorry, uh, Lazar picks up on that. He has this great book, which I highly recommend, called Reflections on the Mathematical Principle of Infinitesimal Analysis. And what he does is, let's imagine that we have this world where we have idealized mechanics. How do we, how do we investigate one or the other? We use infinitesimal analysis. And uh, so in Atkins, we've seen that Newtonian motion is a series of infinitesimal steps. What's the infinitesimal step? Okay, so anyway, uh, and, and Carnot, so it justifies the use of, of calculus. It's just like, well, obviously, there are no infinitesimals. This, is, this whole reason is, doesn't make any sense. It's stupid. But it's justified because it works to give us these mechanical theories. These mechanical idealizations are really great. Uh, so, uh, blah, blah, blah. okay, so I'm going to say this, this complementary thing, uh, Bohr didn't miss this. this is, he was inducted into the, the Order of the Elephant or something like that in, in Denmark. And, and then he said, you have to have a coat of arms. This is a coat of arms, uh, yin yang diagram in the middle. He was very clear on that. Uh, and uh, it says, uh, contraries are complementary over the top. As was mentioned before, contraries, the Greeks are some opposites. Uh, so, okay, so anyway, what happened, let me just go to real quick. So it happens after Mopartoni and, and uh, Carnot, they have this idea, and it goes up into thermodynamics. And the other side, it goes off to the 
Grange and Euler and, and Hamilton. And they'll say, oh, that's very nice, yeah, but we, it's not very useful. We want to you know, get it down to mechanical, solve mechanical problems. So they get a version of the principle of lease action that you hear most, like, most likely you've heard of. And it's a mechanical version of the principle of lease action about the minimization of the principle of lease action, as Carnot begins to see it, is actually a principle of optimization. It's just saying, it's not saying, you know, we always want to minimize, you know, maximize. I have an example of a variable pitch prop. You're in a plane. When I'm taking off, I want my prop essentially at maximum power. But when I get up to cruising now, I'll see that I change the yield so it's more efficient and I have minimum power that I'm using and, and uh, more sufficiency. Okay, so I'm just going to go through that. So I have to go on here. Uh, I'll say one thing here about, okay, so about the entropy thing. I got my friends, I call them the entropy cult. You know, that the universe is running down. They get over it. It's not running down. I mean, they can't come up with it. I was, I started out and say, okay, everybody knows, I have water up here, and as the water runs down to the ocean, okay, so the entropy increases. When the water's down here, it's the maximum entropy, right? No more work possible. How did the water get up there? This is equivalent to how did we get a low entropy beginning of the universe? And the answer is they don't have an answer. I go further. There's no possible answer. They only have one process, and the process is increasing entropy. So if your process is increasing entropy, how do you start to get to the low entropy point? You don't. It's not possible. And they can't even conceive it. It's a bunch of nonsense. Uh, and, but the other thing that's cool is so this whole Big Bang thing. I want to point out uh, Weinberg three book. So what you have in the Big Bang going on when you start with the first three minutes is a series of symmetry breaking events. Okay. Symmetry breaking events. Protons come out, protons and electrons separate, boom, boom, things around. Okay. If your if your framework is symmetry and conservation, you have no possible explanation of symmetry breaking events. Get clear on that. There's no possibility. So what happens? Oh, we get stars. You know, stars. We're supposed to have a gradient going down. Stars. Really hot stars. They're very cold. Is that a great gradient? This system is creating gradients. It's not eliminating gradients. Okay. So it's going to. And then in those stars, so closely in those stars, they're cooking away and they cook the elements. I mean, the same when the star class is like 15 minutes or something by one of the models anyway. And boom, and it creates. All these elements, and the elements, and they get spewed out. Okay, and they're they're getting spewed out from from uh, they were created in very high temperature, very high pressure, and then they're spewed out into the into the cosmos. You know, it's like super low pressure, low temperature. You would imagine by these guys' theory that they just fall apart, but they don't. They're created and they're stable, and they need, they have no explanation of that. Okay, I'm gonna try to go on. so. Let's say, let's say you buy into the fact that the universe is not mechanical, that uh, reductionism doesn't work. Where do we go? Okay, so this is a guy, what, what you get is a move towards uh, engineering, engineering knowledge and engineering ontology. So there are all sorts of engineering things around here. <laughs> but uh, we don't have a way of talking about it because we say, oh, well, I can't refer to that because it's not a particle or something like that. So, so the... Uh, Anyway, so this guy, uh, Vincenti, uh, writes this book called What Engineers Know and How They Know It. And basically he says this idea that, uh, that engineers take their knowledge down from scientists and then by some uh, amazing process come up with important things. He says, that we know it's not true. And uh, go on. So, and basically, what he's saying is there all these things are on like airplanes. He's an aeronautical engineer, so it's like airplanes and things like that. Engineers know how airplanes work. They know how cell phones work. Physicists don't. And I would say scientists don't, okay? Because engineers have knowledge of the world, of, of, of things, that is not reducible to. If you couldn't derive the airplane from, from uh, science, if you couldn't derive it from, uh, couldn't derive the cell phone from, from science, then there's something more about them than, you know, okay, and I would say the, the the core thing, I think, is that what science cannot explain that is central to engineering is engines. Okay? 
And engines generate things, and they're not causal products, but they're generated. I'm mean, just going to give you a minute here, two quick applications. We're going to be guys that are origin of life research guys, uh, like Russell and, and, uh, and these guys all think that they're looking at the evolution, which is a chemical evolution if you like, but it's happening in biology, as a constructive metabolic uh, paradigm. Okay, uh, Bill Martin is a transition uh, to complex life based on a unique endosome of the bioenergetic jump rather than natural selection and economic potential. These guys are all anti Darwin. You say anything about Darwin, you're like, Phew. And, uh, and, and uh, it says if Darwinian evolution works like a tinkerer, evolution with mitochondria works like a core of engineers. Uh, the other example that I was mentioning is this is a great example. Like, I have some talks that I'm putting up on YouTube you can look at, but this shift from scientific to participant is dramatically and I think most easily understood that just happened in economics. Romer just got the 2008 uh, Nobel Prize. And what he did is he, he just made this paradigm shift from, from this classical models of, of economics, which didn't work. And what happened was there was all this growth going on that the mechanical model couldn't handle it. And so uh, he comes up with the ideas and technology and all sorts of stuff. Anyway, um, one thing about the engineer who is an engineer, we're all engineers, we're, we're existential engineers, which means that. We have free will. It's sort of like saying, oh, I'm, I, here I find myself in the world and I have the ability to ask in the world, but I don't have any script. Okay. So I'm kind of dumb. I have to like, make choices when I don't have any real basis for the choice. So in order to find a better way in the world, I need to explore and experiment. The fundamental uh, deals. And uh, the engineering thing is uh, sort of tautology of problems. So what are engineers trying to do? They're trying to move from the current state of affairs to a future more desirable, fixed state of affairs trying to make the world better. And the fundamental question is to say, what is science and science is discovery? What is engineering? Engineering is a problem of design. How should we design our, our, our fields, agricultural? How should we design our houses as far as we How should we design our neighborhoods, our cities, uh, urban design? How should we design our economy, tariffs, uh, trade issues? How should we design our political system to preserve it? Well, at that point, you're played as a public. Okay. The American Constitution, it's a design document. It's an experimental design. Says, Let's try and live this way, see if that works. So now, it's all designed. So I'm sure you guys all read the Harvard Business Review, Evolution of Design Thinking. So this is a big deal. And I, I just, to go back to chemistry for a moment, one of my favorite guys who I just I met briefly, but uh, uh, Kenneth Denby, the creative, you know, creative chemical evolution. And he sees, he is a chemist, and he, and he sees chemistry in terms of a, he's going to a sequence a, as, a, uh, as an evolution. And uh, anyway, so I, I'll leave it with that. Yeah? Denby rules. <laughs> Any questions? Perfectly clear, right? Any questions? Yeah, I'm going to go back to the As Boris said, if you're not shocked and confused, you won't listen. No. <laughs> Thank you.